Good morning. This is the Harry Jackson Show, and I am your host, Harry Jackson. This is an unusual day in the nation's capital. Overcast, a little bit cooler. Rain is coming down. And this is a sign, perhaps, of a shower of blessing. Uh, That's what I want to make it into as we look at the top stories of the day. A little bit later on, we're going to have Ted Baer in a second segment. He is the founder and publisher of The Movie Guide, from which he shares a Christian perspective of the news, or I should say of movies, et cetera, and TV shows, forgive me. And I, I think this is very significant in the absence of or the recent death of one of the major movie critics of our time. Uh, it seems as though there's been raised up an amazing voice for the uh, Christian culture. Well, story number one, gun shop tied to Connecticut spree has had violations. And it shows that ATF uh, had records uh, that uh, uh, information, the store's records were not properly kept. And evidently, even folks who were known felons had been able to get guns and something like 3,000 guns were allowed to be purchased after that particular um, incident had taken place. And so we have some issues. We'll come back and talk to you about that a little bit more as we uh, share with David Parlett here in the studio. Second major story for us as we look at it is that abortion foes find fresh energy in state flurry of restrictions. In other words, there is a, an amazing rising up of pro-life folk who are impacting legislation in places like uh, the great state of Ohio, where I was raised, and also in the great state of Virginia, also Arkansas, many other places. And so... Virginia now is the latest poised to toughen the rules on uh, the issue of abortion. And so, really, the question remains, when does life begin? And if it begins as early as uh, conception, then when should we protect the life uh, that has been given by God at that particular juncture? And the beautiful thing about it is that uh, it shows that even though something can be legal, such as abortion, someone standing like AFR Radio steadfastly uh, engaging with the culture can make a major difference uh, in terms of turning the tide, telling the people who listen uh, what the major issues are, And so we have got to understand that uh, Christian radio is a major force for us renewing our minds and refocusing upon what are the important issues of our generation and our day and giving us talking points so that we're not just out here, uh, you know, kind of making all kinds of noise. uh, And we've got all the sound of fury, but no articulation And uh, so we're making some progress, but a pushback is coming where people who are pro-choice are going to push back. I'll never forget in the last election, being in the great state of Ohio, specifically in those places in Columbus, where most folks felt that the election was going to be determined, that the ads were going on and on and on about abortion and the right for a woman to abort a child. And I was thinking, there is nothing about abortion directly that is actually on the election. The presidential campaign then was not about abortion, or was it? It was not about, in some people's minds, a a moral set of choices, or was it? It seems as though... Uh, the radical left ran on their understanding of morality, and then folk on the conservative fi- side ran away from talking about uh, morality and their issues in that time. And uh, I think that was a huge, huge mistake. 
So there's a battle of values that's going on. And again, I think you should know that we're winning. And uh, we're going to slow down at this point and continue to talk about our key stories. Uh, And I want to bring in David Parlett on uh, the remaining stories that we have here. And both of them are intertangled with the issue of Korea, North Korea specifically. And who would have thunk that North Korea would be the center of international attention and that it would be causing so much trouble, especially when we are actually writing checks to that nation, meaning they're being subsidized. And so the word picture I want you to get as we prepare to talk about both a chaplain honored and then a stance taken in and about North Korea I want everybody listening to me to get this word picture. Imagine if you were in a major city in America, let's say Washington, D.C., and somebody was on welfare in the town, been on generational welfare, and then all of a sudden you get a, an alarm and they are on the evening news and they have grabbed somebody and taking them hostage. The person that they've taken hostage is actually their second cousin, two times removed, that lives right next door to them. And they have a gun and they say, I'm going to kill this sucker if you don't increase my welfare check by tomorrow morning. And a lot of folk would say, well, go ahead shoot your cousin, and then I hope you shoot yourself right after it. This, laugh with me, cry, whatever. This is, this is not sophisticated political explanation. It's just an, an analogy. And others would certainly run out and try to save the second cousin two times removed, even though he has the unfortunate of living next to a nut. And then others would sit back and say, Well, we're going to secure the perimeter, but one thing we're not going to do is give this guy any more money because he's already living on my money already. And if I give in to this request, how do I know he's not going to want more money next month? And I can't guarantee whether he's going to take my money and just use it for drugs, alcohol, and some kind of crazy lifestyle. Pastor David Parlin, I believe that in some ways, this is what we have. And I, in dealing with North Korea, we've got someone who, in a sense, can't take care of his own, take care of his own people, can't take care of its own responsibilities, is doing a lot of little entrepreneurial and illegal, I might add, businesses on the side, such as selling illegal contraband to other countries like nuclear information to uh, the folks in Iraq. That would be the equivalent of dealing drugs out of the back of your car uh, in the neighborhood. And so this analogy actually holds true if you really listen to it. And, And so we've got this issue of how do we deal with these folks in a way that does not empower their bad actions and at the same time deals with the fact that nobody's grabbing their second cousin, putting a gun to their head, making all these crazy threats, unless in their own mind there is a high level of desperation. So we got a desperate party. We have major needs. Our values are being questioned. We probably have been subsidizing a crack addict for way too long. And so here we are. And in the inimitable words of one of the generation's greatest false prophets, and uh, that would be uh, Minister Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, the chickens have come home to roost. So what do you think about 
I think I'm making my production folks nervous here. <laughs> See, some of you all thought I was only passed through the ghetto. Some of you thought that I only had a black card that had like a passport visited here, stamps on it. See, y'all didn't know that I actually lived in the ghetto for a while. And uh, so, but this is really interesting, the psychology of bullies. And that is really what we're dealing with. And if you ever lived in an inner city situation, you have to deal with bullies. They are they are around. They don't understand boundaries. And uh, if you let them, uh, they'll take your lunch money one day and they'll take your gym shoes the next day. And uh, they might even take you with them if you're not careful. Yeah. So President Obama honors a chaplain from guess what war, the Korean War, a really uh, a guy that really deserved to be honored, and uh, posthumously uh, he has this cap a chaplain. The man is actually uh, evidently an um, amazing hero, and I think that this is part of the peacemaking uh, that we have for the president. And then North Korea likely can put a nuke on a missile. And then we've got a big picture in USA Today that shows Senator Chuck Hagel, or I should say Defense Secretary Hagel, testifying before the House Armed Services. And um, Thursday, and he's talking about where we are and what are the issues. What do you think about North Korea? What should we do? Should we cut off the money now and take the consequences? Mm, I, I think America certainly has had a historic problem of uh, giving in and sending money to so many terroristic countries and uh, with, with those threats. Yeah, we need to cut the money off. And uh, we thank God at least we're militarily positioning ourselves to protect ourselves. So we're wise in that. But then we need to set up the sanctions and the monies that we so graciously and freely give to terrorists all over the world. Well, if you cut the money off abruptly, the problem becomes that you may actually throw them more headlong into an aggressive war mode. Would you not agree? Yes, sir, because that's going to be their threat, and they want to carry out on their threat if possible. So you should be acting more like the 300-pound giant that says, I'm going on the diet at the first of the year, or should I, and that's quite a few months away, or should I start the process of weaning them off of money. How might you, in practical ways, deal with this threat uh, if you are dealing with a common sense, tangible, live bully in front of you? And can you give us the most profound answer we've heard My, in less than a minute? I wish I could do that. But <laughs> I, I know Secretary of State uh, Kerry is dealing diplomatically with that. But, yeah, you have to wean them off. Uh, immediately and let them know that you're going to you're not going to cower down, but you're going to take a stand and not be bullied. Well, another approach might be also that if I were dealing with a crack addict friend who is desperate is to set up some kind of situation. If I was going to help him out and then I would say, OK, I'm not going to give you cash because I know what you do with your cash. I am going to now set up a series of payments that deal with authorized and legitimate needs for a, a period of time that you have. And I'm going to make sure that your rent and your light bill is paid, but I cannot afford to give you cash because you're going to spend your cash on weapons. I mean, crack. And uh, if I give you money that's not targeted, we're going to find it's going to increase your problems. I, I think you picked up on my little fake Cr slip of the right. tongue. Crack Sorry. for weapons. Weapons were crack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we are in a legitimate mess. Mm. 
And um, this is where you need the wisdom of Solomon. In a few minutes, we'll be back with Ted Baer, founder and publisher of The Movie Guide, a guy I've known for some years, respect highly. Maybe he can at least give us some things to meditate on while we pray for the president. Stay tuned. If you own a business, then you know the ability to take credit cards is necessary, especially if you use the internet as part of your storefront. The shocking thing is there are so many credit card processors who don't think twice about taking care of the processing for immoral or objectionable businesses. If they process for your business, that essentially yokes you with those other companies. But there is an alternative. Cornerstone Payment Solutions will not provide credit card processing for those immoral or offensive companies. In fact, they offer businesses like yours a specific processing program that will support AFA by giving an ongoing donation for as long as your credit card processing is done by Cornerstone Payment Systems. Basically, it's processing with a purpose. And all the details are available at 877-356-1208. That's 877-356-1208. Cornerstone Payment Systems is a registered ISO of Harris Bank, Buffalo Grove, Illinois, member FDIC. A pro-life resource for teenagers. This is a special commentary from the Susan B. Anthony List, named for the suffragette who was proudly pro-life. Young men and women who take a stand against abortion should be prepared to defend their beliefs from challenges by classmates or teachers. Even though an increasing number of young people are pro-life, there is still a need to educate this generation about abortion. A new resource that does this well is John Ensor and Scott Klusendorf's book, Stand for Life, a student's guide for making the case and saving lives. Pro-life teenagers who face challenges will now be better prepared to take a stand for life. Are you pro-life? then visit our website at sba-list.org and discover how you can make a difference. I'm Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thanks for taking a stand. This is the Garlo Perspective. Do you know there are two kinds of peace? There's the peace that God gives, and then there's the peace of this world. In fact, in John 14, it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Apparently the peace of this world leaves your heart troubled and leaves you fearful. In fact, Jeremiah 6 warns, beware of those who say peace, peace, when there is no peace. What is the peace that God gives? If it's different than the world, it means when you have peace with God, you may be at war with the world. God says, I will reconcile all things to myself. The peace that God gives causes you to feel at peace with God, which puts you at odds with the world. But it is worth it to have his peace. Choose it this day. Jim Garlow at GarlowPerspective.com. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I am your host, Harry Jackson. Delighted to be with you on this rainy day in Washington, D.C. And uh, my co-host, David Parlett, is here, Dr. David Parlett. And on the line, we have one of our cultural heroes, and that is Dr. Uh, Ted Baer, founding president of the or a publisher of the Movie Guide and chairman of the Christian Film and Television Commission, as well as noted critic, editor, educator, I should say, lecturer, and media pundit. Some of your books, uh, Brother Ted Bear, are How to Succeed in Hollywood Without Losing Your Soul. Wow. And a field guide to Christian screenwriters, actors, publishers, directors, and more. An amazing grace of freedom. Dr. Bear, welcome to the Harry Jackson Show. How are you today? I am doing absolutely great today, and I'm on the East Coast instead of in Hollywood. If it was Hollywood, it would be a a little early in the morning for me, but it's great to talk to you, Harry. Well, it's great to talk to you, and uh, uh, we uh, bump into each other quite a bit, and um, 
I just thank you for the usefulness of your work, especially in this day. And uh, so instead of starting off with the big questions of what should we do about uh, the movie and uh, game influence that is creating gun violence in the world and how should we stop North Korea, we'll come back at least to the guns a little later. Um, Many people believe that Hollywood is really, the phrase is, going to hell in a handbasket. And literally, they are getting involved in occultism. Do you think we can reclaim the screen at all? Well, you know, there's always been a, a modicum of, uh, of terrible stuff in Hollywood. It peaked in about uh, 1979, 1980 when a book came out called Hollywood Babylon, which was uh, um, sort of extolling and commending all the evils. At that point in time, if you saw a minister, a priest, or a bishop, <laughs> you'd see mm-hmm. them with a knife in their hand, knocking on the door to bring, you know, dripping with blood. But today, we see a difference. When we oh, started Movie Guide, there was one movie with positive Christian content. It was Trip to Bountiful. Today opens 42, the Jackie Robinson story, which when you see it, is filled with so much faith and values. It's the story of Jackie Robinson, who had the strength to turn the other cheek when he was being reviled for breaking the color barrier in baseball. It's the story of his manager, who was the man of such great faith he would not even go out to the games on Sunday. So it was a story of Christian faith, which is very explicit in the film. We've got another film, Not Today. Of course, we just had the Bible series. So actually, it's gone from one movie with positive reference to Jesus, to 57% of the movies. So we're on a roll. We see some very positive family films. When we started, there was only six family films. Now there's a family film every week, which is nice. We've got one out there called The Crude. It's not crude. It's about a cave uh, man who learns that he he needs to trust God and go toward the light. There's a lot of Christian symbolism in it. So um, I could sit here all day talking about the good news, but the bad news is that there's still 43% of the movies that are attacking the faith and values of our children, and uh, they do corrupt them. And you've got Hangover 3 coming out soon. And so uh, the key to all of the bad out mm-hmm. there is to help parents teach their children to make wise decisions. And that's what I'm doing here in, in North Carolina and South Carolina. I'm speaking at universities and schools, and I just spoke at a, uh, a facility last night where, you know, the grandparents, and they were saying, how can we help our children? So we teach them how to do just that. Wow. Well, you know, we could rehearse the good for a while. And I think that's very important that you bring these good measures forth because um, it does feel overwhelming for someone uh, like myself. The other day I was clicking through uh, the channels. I was very tired, but I was in this state where I couldn't really go to sleep. I wanted to, quote, quote, watch something I quickly went through um, some of the program uh, on some of the Christian channels, and uh, for whatever reason, those weren't hitting it that day. And then channel after channel after channel after channel after channel after channel after channel 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 was feeling like we were in Hollywood Babylon, as you said (laughs) earlier. So I want to thank you, uh, and 42... Could we unpack that just a little bit more in that race is such a major problem? And as you know, the Trayvon Martin shooting happened down in Sanford, Florida, and in the city of Sanford, uh, they threatened uh, this very man, Jackie Robinson, on two occasions that if the sun went down on him while he was supposedly playing in the minor leagues in their little town, they'd lynch him. Um, is there any more you would say about its work on that area of race relationships, the movie 42? Well, the movie, I know the people behind the scenes in the movie, so uh, there are people who, uh, uh, one of them is a great person of faith and values, is a great friend, but uh, who we've uh, mentored and discipled for a long time. But what's good about the movie, Harry, is it shows that the Christians, actually just a handful of Christians were being able to, were standing against the flood of, uh, of uh, obscenities and 
anger and racism. It wasn't uh, people from you know <laughs> the Baha'i faith or whatever that is, and uh, or other right. groups. And I speak all over the world. It was people of faith in Jesus Christ, because in Christ we know that, uh, as Paul said, there is no slave or, or free. There is no, uh, uh, you know, in, in Christ we have equality, we have grace. God created all men equal. And uh, that's the belief system that gave the coach the strength of character to hire Jackie and gave Jackie the, uh, the strength of character, his faith in Jesus Christ, to stand against the wiles of the adversary, the people who were against him. We're not people of faith and values. That's powerful. So we should try to make a movie like this very successful for the obvious reasons that what you feed in this regard, you'll get more of. Um, Absolutely. It should be very good. Remember, this is, an, is a mature film. There's some foul language. Everything else is, uh, uh, except for a couple guys getting dressed in a locker room, so you see their upper torso. But otherwise, it's... It's not a film with the foul language that I would ask little children to, but I think teenagers need to see it so that they understand who stood against the uh, false uh, dichotomy that had been imposed on America by people who didn't know Jesus Christ had created all men equal. Wow, that's very helpful. Teenagers have been on my mind. Let's take a few minutes to unpack your work. Specifically, you're the publisher of the movie guide. Tell our listeners why this guide is so important, and please uh, explain your rating system. Uh, some people presume they know and they've seen you, but how would one really use it? And I'm hoping uh, that perhaps many who are listening today will actually uh, become intrigued and you get some new users to the guide from this program. Well, the theory behind it, which uh, you've just expressed, uh, probably as well as I could, is that what makes a difference, today we have a choice at the box office. You can vote just like you vote at the ballot box, except the box office uh, produces movies that create the dreams, the scripts of behavior of children and grandchildren. So if you vote today for a good movie like 42 or a Christian movie like Not Today, it'll do well at the box office. If you vote for a movie like Scary Movie 4, which has got more violence, more cruelty, more sex, more meanness, more sadomasochism, it's going to do well. So the most powerful person in Hollywood is not Ted Turner, who lost his network, and it's certainly not Michael Eisner, who lost his job at Disney. It's the 12- to 24-year-old who goes today to vote for the movie. To either vote wow. for Jackie Robinson to break the color barrier to, or to vote for a scary movie to kill and maim and mutilate helpless and defenseless people. And the way we get children to change in that regard is to help them know before they go, and that's what we do with Movie Guide. We don't try to do thumbs up and thumbs down. That's what Roger Ebert, the late Roger Ebert, just did. We don't try to be a traffic cop. We try mm -hmm. to help people develop discernment by saying, this is what's in the movie. Now, you look at it, and you learn whether you should go or not. We want people to be uh, not only discerning between good and evil, but to be wise enough to choose this day which one they're going to vote for. So we, we give them information. And, you know, I was on a program like this, I think, with Don Wattman, and uh, some mm -hmm. person called in and said their daughter wanted to go to a movie that uh, liked scary movies. It was just abhorrent, and then read our movie guide, and then it said some poor defenseless woman's head was cut off and used as a hockey puck, and the doc daughter said, I don't want to see this. So we, we're very clear in the movie guide review because it's easier. It's to, when you read it, you can say, I don't want to have to put up with this stuff. I can make a wise decision, and I can teach you because we've been doing this for years. We had 60 professors come together at City University of New York in the late 70s and put together the first media literacy course. We can teach parents how to teach their kids five minutes a day want to choose the good and reject the bad. The good is there before us. You can vote at the box office today, and you can vote for the good. I love it. Um, I'd like to ask you a question in relation to that. Uh, the influence of uh, the gay uh, lifestyle, sex, uh, violence, these themes, uh, how do they influence our culture today? Well, everything about a, a movie and television, and we're talking about movies because they're the big, big thing in our society, but, and people know movies, but you, when you get into games that 
don't know them as well. There have been over 500,000 studies. Now, this was about six or seven years ago that Senator Lieberman and the Congressional Study on Violence said 500,000 studies. So I just hired a young publicist, and uh, uh, she said there couldn't have been that many. And I said, every school and university in the world is doing these studies. So I put signed her up for psychi- psychiatry today and uh, sociology today. And just on media violence, every day there's a flood of studies that come out. And 99.99% of those studies show the influence that it influences kids in, in different ways. Uh, we know that. There's actually only one study that it didn't have an influence, and nobody in Hollywood believes that because it wouldn't carry advertising. Nobody would pay $3 million for an ad on the Super Bowl if it didn't uh, sell uh, Cadillacs or, or razors or, <laughs> or drugs right. that you don't need. So uh, the fact of the matter is we know it influences people. What confuses people, and that was a brilliant question, is that different people have different influences. We know from all the studies that about 7 to 11 percent of the kids uh, want to copy the violence. That's not all the kids. That means 80 percent of the kids are not copying the violence, and a lot of those who don't copy it are scared by it. We also know that about 25 percent from a Dartmouth study want to copy uh, the alcohol and drug addiction, so they see something like hangover, three, with a lot of sex and with a lot of drugs in it. Uh, forget the sex for a moment. And they want to go out and think that they can go on a binge and have fun. And then about 31% want to copy the sexual activity. And then about 60% want to buy things they don't need. And when I'm lecturing, I say about my uh, dear wife who came from Argentina at the age of nine. Their family uh, fled the Perón in Argentina. And she was watching TV and bought these little dinosaurs on TV. And the, she thought they were going to be big. And they turned out to be so minuscule, couldn't see them with a magnifying glass. So... The fact of the matter is we have different susceptibilities, and you cannot lump everybody together, but, you know, God has seven deadly sins. So uh, the media works on each one of our propensity, and it does work on our good. Jackie Robinson's story is going to encourage a lot of people to get over their prejudices and to think about who Christ is and about the, the fact that Jesus can make a difference in their life. So how do we get a hold of the movie guide? We've only got about a minute. Uh, 30 left. How does one get a hold of your movie guide if they're not signed up yet? Well, just go to movieguide.org. We actually send out a free uh, a newsletter every Friday with the new movies coming out. It just talked about 42 and not today. And then we send a, uh, a newsletter out every Tuesday and all the new DVDs are coming out. Uh, and we, we would love to help people in any regard. We have a copy of the Culture Wise Family there. Sign up today and mention Mary Jackson and I will, uh, I'll give you actually a discount on the Culture Wise family. We want people to teach their kids to be culture wise. So go to movieguide.org today. Wow, that is really great. And um, we really appreciate the stats. Is there any place we can get and rehearse? You went through really quickly the influence of these various things about what percentage. Uh, hit what? You know, we got about 30 seconds left. Is there any place I can look this up on your website or a resource I can read for my study? Sounds like I need to be preaching to my youth workers and then talking to parents in these terms and using the stats and the facts uh, that you brought forth. A new study just came out that said that the majority of Christian parents want cultural wisdom for their children. You can get the book. All of those stats are in the book that I just said. We have articles on it almost every week. But we're also doing a six-week course for churches, uh, just like uh, Rick Warren's courses, et cetera, so that you can uh, get a little video and then a study guide to just in six weeks uh, help your children develop uh, media wisdom, and then we teach you how to do more in two or three minutes a day. That's not a lot of time to save your child from going off the deep end. It really isn't. I think we're going to sign a lot of folks up at our churches for those six-week study. Ted Bear, you're doing a great service uh, to Christ and his kingdom and to the community at large. Thank you for coming and being with us. And folks, stay tuned to The Harry Jackson Show. We'll be right back after this break. Thank you. 
There's no greater feeling of patriotism and appreciation for the men and women who gave their lives for our freedom than to stand at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association and American Family Radio. That will be just one of the many stops we'll have in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, as we explore our spiritual heritage, our Christian history. For all the information on these tours in June and September, with Stephen McDowell of the Providence Foundation joining us, please go to the website spiritualheritagetours.com, spiritualheritagetours.com. Or call us at 800-FAMILIES, 800-F-A-M-I-L-I-E-S, for a free brochure. And join us on one of our spiritual heritage tours in June and September. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, Executive Director of Life Issues Institute. During a recent Judiciary Committee hearing in the U.S. Senate on Gun Control, Texas Senator Ted Cruz questioned the constitutionality of an assault weapons ban promoted by Senator Dianne Feinstein from California. This got Senator Feinstein's dander up lashing out against Senator Cruz. She emotionally argued that in the tragic Sandy Hook shooting, to use her words, youngsters were dismembered. Yes, it was a horrible and tragic event, but what pro-abortion Senator Feinstein chooses to ignore are the more than 3,000 babies who are intentionally dismembered every day in abortion mills throughout our nation. Why aren't the California Senator's humanitarian efforts directed at abortion, which is each day 160 times more deadly than Sandy Hook? Check out Life Issues on Facebook and stay more informed than you've ever been. With today's Faith to Action commentary, here's Janet Porter. No matter what you've been hearing in the media, the battle for marriage isn't about equality. It's about freedom, ours. You see, people are already free to marry. But as much as single people might like to wear fancy clothes, have a cake, and get lots of presents, we don't redefine marriage to include single people because being single isn't the same as being married. To be married, you need to conform to what marriage is. You may love your sibling, aunt, or nephew, but that's not marriage. Marriage is the union of one man and one woman, the same as it's been through all of recorded history. If marriage is lost to the homosexual agenda, It will be used to silence all those who disagree. Find out more at F2A.org. Visit F2A.org for more commentaries and action steps, along with news, links, and much more for your state. Go to F2A.org. Welcome back to the Harry Jackson Show. I am your host. Harry Jackson, joined by Dr. David Parlett from Beltsville, Maryland. And the weather here is rainy. What is it like out there with you? It's shifted from wintertime to somewhere near late spring. And the pollen has been horrific. Allergy fighters have been fighting. uh, And it has been a mess. What about your area? And we have just been talking the last segment with Ted Baer, founder and publisher of The Movie Guide and chairman of the Christian Film and Television Commission. And uh, he shared a lot of great things with us. I love to hear that man talk. And um, David Parlett here gave him a question. Can you rephrase... Um, or restate for us the question you asked him, and then we'll kind of bat that around a little bit about its implications for our folks again. We're dealing with the influence of the movie industry upon our culture, particularly on our young kids, whether it's dealing with violence, with guns, or sexuality, uh, these areas that penetrate the mind and the heart and cause kids to go out and live a little differently than the way their parents or their mom or their dad raised them or the way they were raised in church. And uh, as he said, it does have an impact upon them, uh, even though politicians and others may say, well, we had the freedom to say what we want to say. 
uh, we still have to be careful um, in how we're affecting the younger culture. Well, he said your question was very insightful, and I would have to agree that, that talking about how the percentage of influences, and uh, yeah, he, I, I can't repeat those numbers exactly, and we're going to research them so we can share them, but he seemed to suggest that whatever temptation test trial uh, you identify with, sin, uh, that as that is thing is flashed up, promoted uh, on the screen, folk will gravitate toward that, and it has a reinforcing element to darkness, if you will, to sin, to aberrant behavior, even if you reject it so. Right, what do you think about even that? in the uh, Batman uh, movie uh, where there was the Colorado killing after that, the man wanting to portray the Joker, wanted to be the Joker, wanted to kill people based on, uh, if we could say, the insanity of the character of the Joker, just reliving that out um, in real life killed a lot of folks unnecessarily. And so we tend to step into this unrealistic world uh, that Hollywood has created for us, and we want to be like that character. Uh, and, and we choose dangerous, evil characters, we become like them. Well, I think that's well said. I mean, in the USA Today, we have a story uh, entitled Grim Fantasies Revealed in Texas Stabbing Case. If we go back to what he said, um, then this guy, Dylan Quick, uh, who stabbed 14 people with a razor knife at Lone Star College's Sci Fair campus, uh, told investigators that he had researched mass stabbings on his computer about a week before the attack and had sharpened hairbrushes and pencils to use as weapons, the warrant said. Only one person remains hospitalized Tuesday, and that person was listed in good condition. Now, uh, I think that we've got a problem. Now, at his home, listen to this, at his parents' Houston home where Quick lives, police found books about mass killings, serial killings, along with, are you waiting, Mm. a Hannibal Lecter mask Mm -hmm. and... Animal Dissection Kit. Lecter is the, and I'm quoting directly now from USA Today, the cannibalistic serial killer in the 1991 film, The Silence of the Lambs. And uh, so, quote, he stated that he had fantasized about cutting people's faces and wearing them as a mask since he was eight, Mm. eight Mm. years old. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I'm there like right, you. Right. Kids do not think about that at eight years old. You're thinking about going out and play ball, having fun, rolling around in the dirt. You're not thinking about cutting people's faces and wearing them as your mask. That has got to be as evil as uh, you can get. It, it, it does. And, and if you look at the guy's picture here, um, I mean, he looks just like the average everyday uh, young person going to a college, uh, there doesn't seem to be any major problem with him. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, mm. he has got a lot of issues. Mm-hmm. We're importing terrorism through our movie industry, <laughs> just like the Taliban does over in the Middle East. We're doing the same uh, by penetrating the minds of our youth and teaching them uh, to go beyond what's natural. I, and, you know, we should, we should be able to to reject that, but uh, it's hard to go past what the media teaches you and trains your mind to think. I I think you've hit on something. I like the fact that there's a six-week course that the movie guide is giving, and so I said to myself, part of the summer training, you know that we're going to bring forth with our own teenagers at our hub church, and then we lead a network of networks, a fellowship of churches uh, that between 12 and 1500 churches, that group of folk, we are going to be encouraging them to reach out and use these kinds of guides because his concept of developing discernment is great. It really is. Look, look at this. 
quick, this gentleman here says, uh, USA Today article, was hearing impaired, is born deaf, and he's got uh, a certain specialized ear implant to help him. But he told investigators that he had read books about mass murders. We already talked about this. And among the titles that were seized were Hitless Hitman and the Book of Five Rings, a 17th century text on Japanese sword fighting, and uh, that he wanted to admire and mimic other mass killers, Uh such as James Allen Fox, uh, or said James Allen Fox, a criminologist at Northeastern. And um, it's interesting, I guess they kept using, um, Mr. Fox did, the analogy of Hannibal Lecter. So if I've got a rejected child, such as the guy that came up with really the Sandy Hook Elementary School uh, killings, here's somebody who's got some kind of psychological or emotional or physical impairment. They're ostracized. There's an element of rejection uh, from the culture that's in their life. Therefore, there's an anger issue that's been set up. I don't know his background, but in the background of the guy by Sandy Hook, estrangement from the dad, perhaps. Now we've got someone who might be set up to be a sociopath that I now feed with uh, all this material. Mm -hmm. And that father wound that parent wound can go deep in the heart of a child and they make inner vows many time and they carry them out, uh, not even, not even really planning them at first, but they begin to carry out things. They begin to speak in their heart in anger in resentment, at how they're hurt. And so, uh, uh, Jesus says now the eyes are the window to the soul. And so what we begin to behold and we watch and we start studying, whether it's Hannibal Lecter, uh, I was just thinking about, uh, Saddam Hussein, he said he used to love to watch the Godfather movies, the killing movies in, in the, the violence. Um, and, and, and that was his, the Godfather yeah. was his role model, you know. Yeah, uh, he took that to a whole nother level. Too. <laughs> he took it to a whole nother level to, to a nation. But, so we understand it, as Jesus sure. teaches us, what we look at, what we behold, it, it's the door that gets into our soul, and then it rearranges our life, and then we like almost some what, like, robots walk out that pre-programmed plan of of evil. Well, you're listening to the voice of David Parlett, the co-host of the Harry Jackson Show. You can reach us at Bishop Harry, hashtag the Harry Jackson Show, or theharryjacksonshow.com. We want to hear from you. Engage in this discussion with us. And I believe you've hit on some powerful things. Unpack. Uh, for us in just a few seconds, the thing you alluded to called a father wound, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, many people feel a separation from their dad. Describe, A, what it is in clear terms. Mm. God's given us a father to look up as a role model and example. The father is to train, to teach, to protect their child. And when the father abdicates his responsibility and does not do what he was created to do for his child, then the child really doesn't have an anchor. It doesn't have a stability or stable life. And so the wound can go so deep that the child becomes angry and he begins to resent uh, the fact that he didn't get from his dad what he should have gotten. Uh, He begins to carry out uh, his anger in very abstract and sometimes very, uh, very bad ways. So when the father is gone, we know from previous guests, there are all kind of sociological ramifications. The kid becomes discouraged, doesn't do well in school. There are all kind of acting out behavior. In some cases, you're saying there is this resident anger. Mm-hmm. And I did a study once uh, in writing my first book, in-laws, outlaws, and the functional family, which you can get by uh, coming to the HarryJacksonShow.com. The book is called In-laws, Outlaws, and the Functional Family. I did not quote 
the following information more than in passing. But I did a personal study of the War of the Roses in England and just out of curiosity went back and looked at the fact that the War of the Roses was the biggest civil war in the history of England. It was essentially a family dispute over the monarchy of England. And if you went back up both sides of the family tree, you found two disturbing things. Every other generation, predictably, you had a warring king versus a stay-at-home king. When the warring kings were out doing battle all the time and they were not in their kingdoms, they produced sons who had a disconnection from their fathers, and these sons had all kinds of licentious lifestyles. And you can imagine from all across this aberrant sexual strata, they came out everywhere. And uh, so they had babies out of wedlock, all kinds of mischievous behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the husbands were at home, they produced people with a strong sense of ownership and, and a strong sense of investment in the nation. But often those sons would rise up with a protective sense of destiny and they would fight and serve the nation, and it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But it was, in fact, those sons who learned how to cheat, who didn't learn the rules, whose lifestyles were all over the map. Um, one king had behaved so badly that he was assassinated by the people in his courtyard he had certain sexual proclivities, and the nobles of his day gathered around, murdered him, tortured him, and the way that they uh, buried his body, you could not see uh, the disfigurement and all the stuff that the guys had done to them. But they basically said, you were a debaucher, and you took uh, all your pleasures, like the story of the guy Dorian Gray, um, you know, who sold his soul to the devil years ago. You heard this story in England. You've done all this instead of honoring your covenant commitment to the nation, and they killed him, and then boom, uh, the beat goes on. So two families, part of one extended family, ripped their nation apart. At the heart of it was a family breakdown and the ramifications of absentee fatherism and the father wound and the lack of passing on generation to generation a sense of honor, integrity, and the proper male guardianship of their families. Interesting thought that from that level you could actually destroy a nation. Well, we're coming to the very end of our program today. This weekend, of all the things you're doing, go to church. Uh, there's a word for you. There's some application. There's fellowship. And we'll see you again on Monday and after your pleasant weekend. And we hope that you'll uh, keep Christ first in your thoughts as you enjoy yourself during this weekend time. Thank you, David Parlett, and thank you all for listening.